I'll move on to the first talk, which is uh, myself. Okay, so as I said, this is uh, very much an introduction to PET and SPECT for people that uh, come from the life sciences. And so we're going to really focus very much on the, uh, the fundamental principles of uh, nuclear imaging technologies. And the aims uh, for, for this particular lecture um, are for you to be able to explain the following concepts. Uh, firstly, the tracer principle and its importance in PET and SPECT molecular imaging how radiation emitted from the body is detected externally using SPECT and PET instrumentation. And uh, Dennis, uh, when he gives his talk to follow me, will go into that in more detail. And finally, we'll talk about the key principles in forming a reconstructed image of the tracer, tracer distribution in the body. So we'll uh, talk just a little bit about how tomographic reconstruction works. Okay, so to begin, um, with the tracer principle. This is, this is a, a very important principle which um, underpins everything that we do in, in nuclide, radionuclide imaging. And uh, it was a technique that was developed by uh, George de Hevesy, who was a, a Hungarian physicist. And he's shown here with this very notable group of, uh, of colleagues. So this is George de Hevesy in the, the middle row here over on the right. And uh, he, um, went to, to work as a young postdoc in Ernest Rutherford's lab. And, um, and Ernest Rutherford had a large batch of radioactive material that he'd received from Marie Curie, who's sitting right next to him there in the front row. And those three people all had a, a very substantial uh, impact on the early development of radio, radionuclide counting techniques and, and measurements. All three of them won, won Nobel Prizes for their contributions. And the task that Rutherford gave George de Hevesy when he came to his lab was to take uh, a, a rather large sum of radioactive mate material. It was in the raw state of pitch blend ore. And um, normally this pitch blend ore was separated into radioactive radium uh, in order to do radioactivity experiments. But um, there was also this leftover material, uh, all these, uh, these lead salts, which were still radioactive. And Rutherford was interested in what was contained in these lead salts. And in particular, he wanted to be able to extract what was at the time called radium D, because it had some, some interesting radioactive properties. So he asked George de Hevesy to, to try and separate uh, the radium D from the lead salts. Uh, now, to cut a long story short, uh, de Hevesy, who um, was a very uh, well-regarded uh, well uh, chemical experimentalist, was unable to separate those two entities after trying for two years. And the reason he couldn't separate them becomes apparent when we look at the, the chart of the nuclides. So just focusing in, in on this region of the chart of the nuclides, what we find is that uh, what de Hevesy was trying to separate as radium D uh, is actually an isotope of lead. It's lead 210. And he was trying to separate lead from the, the uh, lead 206, which is the stable form of lead. So he was trying to separate lead from lead uh, using chemical techniques, which is obviously not possible. Uh, and so that could have been considered a failure, but George de Hevesy uh, decided to, uh, to turn what seemed like a failure into uh, into a new experimental technique, which he, he called the tracer principle. And the idea was uh, that um, since isotopes uh, of the same element have the same chemical properties, uh, therefore they act in the same way in chemical and biological reactions. And so he could use this uh, inability to separate these, um, these two uh, species to his advantage. And so, so what he, what he realised was that when, uh, when you place uh, a, uh, a radioisotope in a biological or an environmental system, that the radioisotope can be used as an indicator of the non-radioactive counterpart. In other words, it can be used as a, as a tracer. And importantly uh, for this 
to work as a tracer, the radioactive compound has to be present in, in the system in such small qu quantities that it doesn't perturb the system. And so the concentrations of these radioactive indicators uh, need to be extremely low if they really behave like true tracers. And the sorts of concentrations that we typically deal with in PET and SPECT are on the order of uh, uh, nanomolar to picomolar concentrations. So these are extremely minute concentrations in the body. So that's the tracer principle, and, and it only really works in PET and in SPECT because radio radiation detectors are incredibly sensitive, so they can pick up these very low concentrations in the body. And, uh, and just to, in terms of terminology, when we use the tracer technique in radionuclide imaging systems, we refer to that tracer as a radiopharmaceutical. So, uh, so we're just going to talk now a little bit about the, the key points for PET and SPECT and some of the differences between them. So PET isotopes are cyclotron produced. They typically have very short half-lives uh, of minutes to hours. We have two uh, gamma rays emitted for each nuclear decay. And we'll see in a moment that that requires uh, what we call coincidence detection. And that also means that we can use electronic collimation. So um, that'll become apparent in a moment as well, what we mean by that term. And that gives us very good detection efficiency. Uh, and PET typically uses a stationary ring of detectors surrounding the subject. Inspect the isotopes uh, may be either reactor generator or cyclotron produced. They typically have longer half-lives than PET, typically hours to days. We have one gamma ray, usually, per nuclear decay. And uh, we'll see later on that that means that we require a physical collimator to determine the, uh, the line of sight of that gamma ray. And physical collimation, uh, in the case of SPECT, means that the efficiency is much lower than it is in PET. And it also requires typically rotating detectors. Not necessarily, there are SPECT spec systems that don't rotate. Um, but often we use rotating detectors. In terms of the isotopes that we use, the radioisotopes we use in PET and SPECT, here's a list of the more common ones. And uh, you'll notice there that the, uh, the half-lives of the PET isotopes are typically quite uh, short, from uh, minutes to just a couple of hours in the case of fluorine-18. Um, and, then, uh, and then the com more common SPECT radioisotopes are shown at the bottom there with half-lives of, of hours or days. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, um, SPECT isotopes can be made in a reactor. So MOLLE-99 is made in a nuclear reactor, um, and then a generator system allows us to extract technetium, whereas indium and thallium uh, are made in, uh, in cyclotrons. So now turning to the, uh, the decay process, and uh, just what I just wanted to highlight an, a fundamental difference here between PET and SPECT. So whereas in SPECT we have uh, the nucleus decaying and emitting uh, either a gamma ray directly from the nucleus or, or via some other um, particulate emission, in PET uh, we generate two gamma rays each time the nucleus decays. And, that happens via the emission of a, um, of a positron from the nucleus. And, um, and that occurs in, in nuclei that are unstable because of an excess of, of charge or an excess of protons, if you like. So the positron is emitted and it actually travels a short distance away from the nucleus, uh, inter interacting with surrounding uh, electrons and, and losing uh, kinetic energy with each interaction. Uh, until eventually it reaches thermal energies and it either combines with an electron to form positronium or else it annihilates immediately upon interacting with an electron. But either way, um, the mass of the positron and the electron uh, together is completely converted into energy in the form of these two, two gamma rays that are emitted in opposite directions. And that's, uh, that's key to the way PET works. So, um, so we take advantage in PET of the fact that these gamma rays are emitted in opposite directions. Also, you notice that these gamma rays are relatively energetic. They're quite high energies at half an MeV. 
Um, and the other point to note is, as I said before, the energy um, comes com from a complete conversion of the mass, the combined mass of the electron and the positron, according to Einstein's equals mc squared. So I'm not going to go into detectors in any detail because Dennis uh, will do that. Um, but the, uh, the, the basic components of a detector uh, include a, uh, a scintillator or, or some uh, device that's able to, to convert this gamma ray into a measurable signal. And so the most common form of detector uh, uses a, an inorganic scintillator, sorry, an inorganic scintillator which converts the gamma ray into visible light which is detected by a photocathode, um, which is uh, part of the photomultiplier tube shown here. And uh, without going into the details, that electrical signal is accelerated and, uh, and amplified through a series of, um, of anodes until at the other end of the, the PM tube, uh, we get an output signal which is, which is measurable. Still only in millivolts, but, but measurable. And those, that basic construct of a detector is used in both SPECT and PET. Some of the differences, though, are that uh, we use different types of uh, scintillators in SPECT and PET. And uh, I'm not going to, going to go through all the details on this, this table. Um, but just to highlight a couple of the common scintillators that are used in SPECT and PET. So first of all, sodium iodide. Um, doped with thallium is, is by far the most common scintillator for SPECT. And um, the more common uh, PET scintillators are shown here. Um, you'll see PET systems with uh, one or other of these detectors. BGO is not used so often these days, but you'll still find uh, some commercial systems that use, use BGO. Uh, the one thing I wanted to highlight is just that the density of, of these, detect these uh, scintillators uh, shown here is much higher than it is for sodium iodide. You need much uh, greater stopping power for the more energetic gamma rays in PET than you do in SPECT. And also in general, um, the light decay constant for PET, ice, uh, for PET scintillators is generally higher uh, than it is for uh, SPECT scintillators such as sodium iodide. So this is a relatively slow uh, light decay uh, these ones have relatively fast decay, with the exception of, of BGO. And that's because in PET we need very good timing resolution in order to detect uh, the two gamma rays uh, in coincidence. And just looking at the, uh, the basic geometry of a SPECT system, uh, and then we'll look at a PET system. So SPECT systems are typically uh, make use of what's called an anger detector, uh, which has uh, the scintillator. Typically, it's a large area um, sodium iodide scintillator. Not always. A lot of the preclinical systems are segmented systems, but often uh, in clinical systems, we use large area continuous sodium iodide scintillators. And then you have an array of photomultiplier tubes that are looking at um, the light produced in that scintillator. So when a gamma ray goes through the collimator, this is the collimator shown in cross-section, which is typically made of tungsten or some other dense material. That allows the gamma ray to travel through only uh, along certain preferred paths before interacting in the crystal, producing a flash of light, which is then seen uh, most clearly from the, uh, the, the PM tubes closest to the event, uh, and less so for those that are further away. And if we look at that detector from the top and look at all the photomultiplier tubes, uh, we see uh, a stronger response from the PM tube above the event and a slightly weaker response from the surrounding photomultiplier tubes. And we use those uh, relative responses of the PM tubes uh, to determine the centroid of the event and where it was actually detected in the scintillator. So a PET system, uh, uses a, a similar sort of a detector construct, but the more common configuration is what we call the block detector. Uh, in principle, it, it, it functions in a very similar way to an anger detector. So you have 
um, your scintillator at the front, you have an array of photomultiplier tubes. Typically, um, the array is, is two by two. Um, in preclinical systems, it's more common that that array of PM tubes is replaced by position sensitive tubes or, um, or a, uh, a solid state photo detector. Uh, but still, the, the, they function uh, essentially the same. And this is the scintillator attached to the PM tubes. It's typically a thicker and denser crystal, as I mentioned before. But the principle is the same. When the gamma ray strikes this block of, uh, of crystal material, the light is distributed um, through, through the block and it's seen um, by the photomultiplier tubes with the relative signals determining which particular crystal uh, the event was most likely to have to have occurred in and the PET uh, system is most often a ring of such block detectors surrounding the subject and the other key uh, key difference between uh, a PET and a SPEC system apart from the fact that there's no physical collimation in front of these detectors is this coincidence processor so you need to have uh, an electronic circuit that looks for um, these uh, these uh, dual events occurring um, very close in time with timing resolution of um, typically nanoseconds. So that's our PET system. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to just spend the next five or ten minutes talking about how we take that data from both SPECT and PET systems and form tomographic images and this is, uh, this is a topic that I normally teach in um, two to three separate uh, one and a half hour lectures. So I'm gonna try and condense this down um, as much as possible. And we're gonna just focus on the, the, the key principles here. So we've collected our data and, uh, and really this slide is just to point out that across several of the modalities that we work with, uh, so CT, PET and SPECT, uh, the data that we collect ends up in a similar mathematical form. And I'm not going to take you through this, but the essential point is that when we look at X-ray CT, uh, the parameter that we really want to reconstruct um, and have estimates for in our image at a voxel by voxel level is the mu value, the attenuation coefficient, or more commonly it's converted into Hounsfield units. But Essentially, we're trying to reconstruct tissue density. And the thing I want to fo you to focus on is that that is in the form of these, these integrals. So we've got line integrals of the tissue density along that, that line and along all the lines passing through the body at which a measurement was made. And what you'll see is we have a very similar sort of form for the data uh, in PET. So here, lambda, which is the radioactive concentration uh, in, in image space is also represented as a line integral. And that's also true for spec. So here's the parameter that we're trying to reconstruct. So all three have these line integrals. In the case of CT, we have to do a transformation to, to, get, the, um, to get the exponent. And for the moment, we're going to ignore this exponen exponential term here in the PET equation and the SPECT equation, which describes the photon attenuation. Uh, we're just going to concentrate on the fact that in all three modalities we have line integrals. So the simplest thing we could do with that data, having measured the accumulated uh, parameter, um, let's say it's radioactive concentration, along these line integrals, is just to take the data and project it back through an image um, in, a, in a plane that corresponds to where the measurement was made. And we could do that at uh, multiple angles. So this is taking some data and just spreading it across all the voxels in a certain image plane, doing it again from this other angle at 90 degrees. And we, we could do that at multiple angles. Um, and by the time we do that over uh, a typical sort of angular subset of 128 angles, we get a rough looking image of our tracer distribution. And in this case, uh, just a couple of uh, spherical sources. But the image is extremely blurred out, and um, and so you've you've got uh, you've got some estimate of the image, but it's a very blurry estimate. And we'd like to improve on that. And without going into the detail um, of how we derive the uh, filter that removes that blurring, um, 
what we actually do is we take that simple back projection technique that I've just described and we filter the projections before we back project. Now, how do we filter them? Well, if we look at the blurring that's caused by this back projection process, it forms um, a blurring described by this one on R function. So if we were to just draw a profile through a, light, a, a point source that's been back projected, you'd get this sort of dis distribution. And it turns out that that, uh, that functional shape is exactly the same in frequency space. And so we can take that, that blurring function and we can design a filter that will exactly um, cancel that out and it's called a ramp filter. So what we actually do in, in practice is to filter each projection before we back project. And now you see that when we do that from multiple angles, you get um, some uh, cancellation of the back projection or, or blurring artifacts that we saw before. And, and after we do that over many angles, we clean up a lot of that back projection artifact and get a nice um, clear reconstruction of the object. And that technique is called filtered back projection and it's, uh, it's used fairly ubiquitously. And just to show how that works on a more realistic example, so this is a sinogram from a PET system showing all the projections uh, at different angles around the subject. And that's what the projection data looks like after we've filtered each projection line by line. And this is what it looks like as we back project each one of those angles. So I'm just going to go through back projecting uh, each of those projections at different angles until eventually we've used up all of the data from all angles and we get a realistic reconstruction and an accurate reconstruction of the object, in this case, uh, a human brain. Okay, so I talked about simple back projection, uh, which is a starting point but gives us very blurring, blurry images. Filtered back projection works perfectly when there's no noise and when you have an infinite number of projections. But in practice, um, we have um, actually have a lot of noise and we have discrete measurements. And so typically we get a lot of noise amplification in our, in our images. So then we turn to iterative techniques. And this is the other class of reconstruction algorithms that are used um, quite frequently in uh, both PET and SPECT. And the general framework is shown here. Uh, so here's our measured sinogram. And generally, we start off by uh, estimating an image. So without any prior information, we just start off with a uniform image. We have no uh, reason to choose any one image over another. So we just start with something that's very simple and it's a uniform image. What we do then is we take that image and we reproject it because we know how the physics of the imaging system uh, works. We can describe it mathematically. So we can take that image and form an estimate of the sinograms which, as you can see, looks nothing like the measured sinogram initially. Then we can compare these two, update our estimate, and reconstruct the errors that are determined at this point to come up with a better estimate. And we just go around that cycle several times, each time improving on our estimate, until we get quite a good match between our estimated projections and our measured projections. And at some point, we stop the process and say that that reconstruction is good enough. Now, the specific algorithm that's used um, most frequently in both PET and SPECT is the so-called MLEM, or Maximum Likelihood Expectation Maximization Algorithm. And um, it's shown here. I'm going to have to just move quickly through these last few slides, but um, I'm not going to try to explain the maths in this equation. Um, I just want to point out that you can see the iterative nature. This lambda here is the estimate of the image in voxel J at the previous iteration, and this is our updated or new estimate of that voxel value. Um, this is our measured data, and this is our estimated projection data. And I just want to highlight some of the key features of this algorithm. First of all, it's guaranteed, so long as our initial estimate is non-negative, it will always produce a non-negative solution. Um, it only involves uh, projections and back projections, so it's a relatively, uh, mathematically and computationally, it's a relatively straightforward algorithm. Um, and it's guaranteed to increase the log likelihood 
um, which, is, which is the likelihood of, that the estimated image um, agrees with our measured projections uh, with increasing iterations. So uh, I think I'll skip over this slide. It's just showing the same thing again, but in a MLEM uh, framework. There's our log likelihood increasing with iteration number until it plateaus, and at some point we stop the reconstruction. So they're the two most common reconstruction methods, FBP and MLEM. Um, and in general, MLEM uh, produces visually more pleasing images. Um, that doesn't necessarily, it always produces the optimal image for a given task, but, um, but it certainly produces visually more pleasing images. Uh, but I think the other more important point is that it also allows us to model uh, the physics. FBP doesn't have that possibility. So it allows us to model things like um, the photon attenuation in the body and the loss of resolution due to the finite point spread function of, of the system. And this example shows that. Um, so this is a, uh, an MLEM reconstruction of an FDG PET uh, study of the brain uh, with no resolution modelling on the top row and with resolution modelling on the bottom row. So you can see how you can quite dramatically affect the quality of the reconstruction through modelling um, the processes of image formation. Uh, and this uh, was just to, to say that one, one of the drawbacks of MLEM is that it is computationally quite slow, but you can accelerate it using OSEM or ordered subsets EM. And I don't think time allows me to really go into this in much detail. Uh, but the general idea is, is just that we update our image much more frequently than we do it with MLEM. So here as I go around this um, different angles, I'm updating the image uh, with every pair of, of projections uh, at, at different angles until I, I come up with having, having used all of the data through one iterative cycle, I've now got a reconstruction here which is equivalent to having done an MLEM reconstruction over many iterations. In this case, uh, it would take 40 iterations of MLEM to achieve this result and just a single iteration of OSEM. Okay, so uh, it's just about time to hand over. So I wanted to finish by just talking about um, uh, a key issue that I've, I've overlooked in going through the, the principles, which is that uh, the photons uh, don't necessarily reach the detectors without having undergone interactions in the tissue. And the two most common interactions are photoelectric effect and Compton scattering. And that does degrade our, our data. And so that means that we have to correct for photon attenuation and we have to correct for scattering if we want to get quantitative images. And without going into the way we do those corrections, what I really wanted to highlight was the, um, the typical numbers. And this surprises some people that in the case of SPECT, uh, if we consider a point in the centre of the human chest, the attenuation correction factor, in other words, the, the degree to which the signal is attenuated at that point, is around 5 to 10 for technetium. In PET, it's actually much higher. So despite the fact that the gamma rays are much more energetic and, are more, uh, and can travel further in tissue, the attenuation correction factors are typically much higher in PET than SPECT. And that's because we have to detect both photons, not just one, but both. And so the probability of attenuation um, is, is considered along the entire line through the body, not just the point from the emission to the edge of the body. So PET attenuation factors are quite high. Um, Compton scattering, uh, the, the effect is about the same in both SPECT and PET. Uh, there are some, um, some differences in the nature and the pattern of the scattering that occurs, uh, but I'm just going to skip over that for the moment. If we do attenuation and scatter correction, we can um, remove a lot of reconstruction artefacts. So this is an FDG PET scan uh, shown without attenuation correction or scatter correction on the left and with on the right. And you can see much more clearly um, a lesion here in the, um, near the diaphragm in, in the, the right lobe of the liver, which was not visible at all uh, without attenuation or scatter correction. And uh, as well as allowing you to get artefact-free artifact images, doing attenuation and scatter correction um, and taking care of how we do the reconstruction, 
allows us to get quantitative results. And I really wanted to finish on that point. This is a point that we may expand on uh, in this series of, of lectures next year. Uh, but the point is that PET and SPECT are inherently quantitative and you can get um, tissue time activity curves that reflect the absolute um, concentration of radiopharmaceutical in the body uh, in different regions of interest. This, this is a SPECT dynamic um, study of the baboon brain looking at the nicotinic receptors and we can calculate voxel by voxel um, receptor binding parameters indicating uh, inhibition and upregulation of, of receptors. Okay, so I'm just a couple of minutes over time. Uh, so to summarise, uh, PET and SPECT are based on the tracer principle, um, whereby radiopharmaceutical, radiopharmaceuticals are administered in minute concentrations so that they don't perturb the system. The radioactive emissions are recorded by very sensitive radiation detectors surrounding the subject, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in uh, just a moment. The recorded emissions from these line integrals representing the accumulated activity um, along lines passing through the subject uh, can be reconstructed using uh, tomographic techniques, uh, either analytical techniques like filtered back projection or iterative algorithms such as MLEM. And we talked about um, accelerating ML MLEM, MLEM to speed up the process. And we also talked about the fact that PET and SPECT are inherently quantitative imaging techniques and that's something that we could explore a little further in the future.